This is um, if you were here last time, this is the second part of this of this series. I'm not sure how many parts it'll have, but it's called three and one, so maybe it'll be part three next week and that'll be it. So we'll see how we get one anyway. But this is uh, three and one. God is a triune being, Amen, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and He created us in His image and in His likeness. God said, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And so God created us in His image and in His likeness as triune beings. Spirit soul and body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The New Living Translation puts it this way. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. Who knows if he doesn't do it, we can't do it. <laughs> now may the God of peace make you holy and not only can he do it, he's done it. We'll get to that in a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. See, unless we understand that we are created in God's image and likeness as triune beings, spirit, soul and body, we will continually be searching our body, continually searching our soul and we'll be frustratedly wondering where the power is that we're supposed to have. Mm -hmm. Has anybody ever wondered that? Mm -hmm. That preacher gets up there every Sunday, tells me I've got all this power, but where is it? I come up against something, where is the power? Well, if you're searching for that power in your body or your soul, you will always come up disappointed. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because that power is not deposited in your body or in your soul. That power has been deposited in your spirit. And then we'll find ourselves being duped into accepting man-made doctrines that basically have been formed intellectually at a soul level in an attempt to explain why what God has said isn't happening. You ever heard that? <laughs> or why we seem unable to do all of the things that Jesus said we would do. When it's not happening, people go to, back to the drawing board and say, well, it must be because of this. And they go back to it, look at it with their mind, with their intellect, and they begin to formulate doctrines. And that's... That's, it's basically out of that dilemma that the cessationist position, you know what, what I mean by that, people who, who believe that God doesn't do certain things anymore? Well, that position came out of that dilemma and, and basically states that all of the things that Jesus told the disciples that they would be doing after they left and after the Holy Spirit came upon them, that they were only for what they called the apostolic age, to give the church a kickstart. But you see, the big problem with that theory is that there's nowhere in the Word of God that states that there will be an end, either to apostolic ministry or to the miraculous and supernatural ministry before Jesus returns. Right. Nowhere. Right. I know they can pluck one out of 1 Corinthians 13, but that's not at all what it's talking about. Mm -hmm. They talk about that which is perfectly come. They say that's the word of God, the scripture, the canon of scripture. Well, I'm afraid that's bogus. <laughs> mm -hmm. I said last time, don't let anyone ever fob you off with, oh well, it's a mystery. <laughs> it's a mystery. When we have actually been given the spiritual capacity to understand what might remain a mystery to everybody else. Amen. It may also seem mysterious to us at first, but in the epistle of James we are told that if any of us lack wisdom or understanding, ever lacked wisdom or understanding? Yep. Well, there's a lot of things I still lack wisdom and understanding in. But it tells me there that I can ask the Father, I can come before my Father in heaven and I can ask him, and it says that he will literally supply me with everything that I ask, the wisdom that I need. Amen. He never refuses anyone, he never turns anyone away. He never slaps you around the head for being an idiot, yeah. asking such a stupid question. No, he liberally supplies the wisdom that you ask for. In fact, in Proverbs it says that wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the most important thing. It says to get wisdom, and it says, and with the wisdom will come understanding. You know what happens when wisdom and understanding come? The mystery is solved. Yes. <laughs> I think I read this last time, but I can't resist reading it again. It's, it's so profoundly, powerfully inspiring and illuminating. First Corinthians chapter 2, 
Verse 1, as for myself, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony and evidence or mystery and secret of God concerning what he has done through Christ for the salvation of men. I didn't come in lofty words of eloquence or human philosophy and human wisdom. For I resolved to know nothing, to be acquainted with this from the Amplified Bible, I resolved to know nothing, to be acquainted with nothing, to make a display of the knowledge of nothing, and to be conscious of nothing among you except Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and him crucified. And I was in, or I passed into a state of weakness and fear and great trembling after I had come among you. And my language and my message were not set forth in persuasive, enticing, and plausible words of wisdom, but they were in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. A proof by the Spirit and power of God operating on me and stirring in the minds of my hearers the most holy emotions and thus persuading them. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, human philosophy, but in the power of God. I read, I read an, an article the other day by, by Jai Lee Grady, he used to be the, the editor of Charisma. And this is what he said, this, this is his most recent article, I think. He said, as long as God has been anointing people to speak for him, people have been running from their assignments and giving God all kinds of creative excuses for their delinquency. The Apostle Paul, who was a silver-tongued Pharisee before he met Christ, was stripped of his eloquence before he preached the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. He felt weak and totally incapable when he spoke. Think about it. The premier apostle of the first century trembled as he spoke. Yet God used his words to spread the message of Jesus Christ throughout the known world. Revivalist Arthur Katz, who died in 2007, wrote about the power of true preaching in his 1999 book, Apostolic Foundations. He says that's the only one qualified to preach is the one who wants to run the other way, like Jonah. The man who sighs and groans when called upon to speak, who does not want to be there, who feels terribly uncomfortable, is the man out of whose mouth the word of true preaching is most likely to come. That's his opinion. You might want to argue with it. There might be a, a few adjustments, but it, I thought it was an interesting article. Anyway, he goes on and says this, that is certainly not the way most of us view pulpit ministry today. We celebrate the smooth and the polished. We look for the cool, hipster delivery style. We measure the impact of a sermon not by whether hearts are slain by conviction, but by how high the people jump when the preacher tells them what they want to hear. That kind of carnal preaching may win the accolades of men, boost TV ratings, and even build mega churches. but the kingdom is not built on smug self-confidence. We need God's words. The church will live in spiritual famine until broken, reluctant, weak, and trembling preachers allow his holy fire to come out of their mouths. If you have a message from God, stop making excuses. Run instead to heaven's altar, raise your hands in total surrender, and let the Holy Spirit touch your mouth with a burning coal. Die to your fears, doubts, and excuses, and let a holy anointing intensify within you until it becomes like fire. Shut up in your bones, just like your old Jeremiah. <laughs> Verse 6, yet when we are among the full-grown, Paul's going on speaking, he says, yet, yet when we are among the full-grown, spiritually mature Christians who are ripe in understanding, we do impart a higher wisdom, the knowledge of the divine plan that was previously hidden. That was a mystery, but it's no longer a mystery. But it's indeed not a wisdom of this present age, or of this world, or of the leaders and rulers of this age who have been brought into nothing and are doomed to pass away. But rather that we are set in, but rather we are set, what we are setting forth, sorry, is a wisdom of God once hidden from the human understanding and now revealed to us by God. That wisdom which God devised and decreed before the ages for our glorification to lift us into the glory of his presence. None of the rulers of this age or world perceived and recognized and understood this. For if they had, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. Nah, 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 nah. Anyway, verse 9. But on the contrary, as the scripture says, what eye has not seen and ear has not heard and has not entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared, made and keeps ready for those who love him. Do you love him? Yeah. This morning, well, he's got a lot of things prepared and made ready for you. Yeah. For those who love him, who hold him in affectionate reverence, promptly obeying him and gratefully recognizing the benefits that he has bestowed. Yet to us, God has unveiled and revealed them by and through his spirit, for the Holy Spirit searches diligently, exploring and examining everything, even sounding the profound and bottomless things of God, the divine counsels and things hidden and beyond man's scrutiny. Come on. I, mean, I know I'm reading it kind of fast, but just let it go straight to your spirit, and your spirit will unpack that, and it'll 
well, blow a hole right through that blockage between your spirit and your soul, and you'll start living life in a brand new way. Amen. For what person perceives, knows, and understands what passes through a man's thoughts, except a man's own spirit within him. Just so no one discerns, comes to know, and comprehend the thoughts of God, except the spirit of God. Now we have not received the spirit, little less, that belongs to the world, but the Holy Spirit, who is from God, big S, given to us, that we might realize and comprehend and appreciate the gifts of divine favor and blessings so freely and lavishly bestowed on us by God. I don't know what that does for you, but that blows a hole in a lot of the religion I've brought up in, it? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was just happy to have a ticket in my back pocket that said heaven on it instead of hell. I mean, I, and to be honest, if that, all, that was all there was, I'd have been happy with that. But God wasn't happy with that. He had so much more. Right. He's always got more. Amen. How much? That's his three favorite words. How much more? How much more? Amen. How much more can you handle? How much more can you take? How much more can you believe for? Because you'll never exhaust it. Yeah. Verse 13. And we are setting these truths forth in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Holy Spirit, combining and interpreting spiritual truth with spiritual language to those who possess the Holy Spirit. But the natural, non-spiritual man does not accept or welcome or admit into his heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Spirit of God, for they are folly and meaningless nonsense to him. And he is incapable of knowing them, of progressively recognizing, understanding, and becoming better acquainted with them, because they are spiritually discerned and estimated and appreciate it. But the spiritual man tries all things. He examines, investigates, inquires into, questions and discerns all things. Yet is himself to be put on trial and judged by no one. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly discern or appraise or get an insight into him. For he, who has known or understood the mind, the counsels and the purposes of the Lord, so as to guide and instruct him and give him knowledge? But we have the mind of Christ, the Messiah. Wow. Come on. <laughs> we have the mind of Christ the Messiah and do hold the thoughts, feelings, and purposes of his heart. Amen. We notice that some people even write the word of God off as being too hard to understand. Come on, they say, oh, well, you know, I, I remember you, 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 know, you hear the old Catholics coming out of church and one would say, oh, I knew you, it was good today. Oh, yeah, oh, sure, oh, va, va, ma, va, ma. And somebody said, well, what was he talking about? Oh, honey, listen, I don't know. <laughs> but like, I'm not doing you, but he was very deep today. So we didn't understand, but he must have been good. He was that deep, he must have been good. But we could have understood it because, you know, we didn't have the same qualifications that he's got. So obviously that's why we couldn't understand. You see, but they write it off as being too hard to understand simply be, because they cannot see, they cannot taste, they cannot hear, they cannot smell, or they cannot touch what the word reveals or says about them. And so because there are no feelings associated with what God says about who they are or what they can do and what they can and what they already have, they think it can't be true. Someone comes and says, well, I'm sick, well, so I can pray for you. Oh, really? Yes, the Bible says if I lay hands on you right now, you'll be healed. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Word of God says. So you pray for them and you, and you release that healing and you say, hey, and, and they say, well, I don't feel healed. Well, what's that got to do with anything? Now, people can get a little bit insulted about that, so I mean, be, just go easy on some folks, you know what I'm saying? But that's the reality. That's the reality. What does is, what, is what they feel have anything to do with? In fact, you'll even ask some people, well, how do you feel now? And they say, well, I don't feel any better. So they go back and pray again. Why? You've just let their doubt get on you. You've let how they feel get on you. You know what happens? We end up in a circus. We end up back in the, at the very best, the some he does, some he doesn't camp. You want me to leave that? Have I left preaching, going to meddling again? <laughs> because there's no feelings associated with what God says about who they are, what they can do, and what they can, can and already have, they think it can't be true. You ask someone, well, you know, would you like to bring a word to you? Oh, I can't do that. Why not? Because well, I don't feel annoying to do that. Well, what does how you feel have anything to do with it? Do you believe what God says? The Spirit of the Lord is upon you. To do what? Well, number one, to preach. 
do you have the spirit of the Lord? Oh well, yes, well, the spirit of the Lord's upon you to preach. I don't feel. It's not anything to do with what you feel. I mean, I said it last week that the only excuses are going. I can do all things through Christ. Then I started work on Monday morning. I said I can't do this. And immediately I thought that. Immediately I thought that. My own words came back to me and said, "Well, <clears throat> they get pardon. I can do all things." Oops. <laughs> I thought I'll never know how to do a weaver's knot. Yesterday, first time I tried it, a few times. Whoa! Got downloaded a YouTube, a YouTube video. Everything's on YouTube. You know that. Watched that a few times. Tried it. Well, I'm not. I'm not very fast at it. But you know what? I think I could get faster at it. But several times during the day, I'm studying. I'm getting the word ready. I go back and try my a couple of bits of weaving. I can, I'm getting this a couple of times it didn't work you know, ping, oh, whoops, and easy. but I can do all things yeah. amen I said to David and Daniel the other day after work I said the only beamer I'll ever be is an embarrassment <laughs> but I can do all things amen, amen. Yeah. if Paul can make tents then I can make Harris Tweed yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. let's be a little part of the process <laughs> amen Hallelujah. You know, the world says, if it's, in fact, I've heard people in the church saying this as well, if something sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. Meaning it's a lie. But you see, in the kingdom, when something in the word of God sounds too good to be true, then it definitely is the truth. Yes. If it doesn't sound too good to be true, it's probably not the truth uh -huh. of God's word. Because everything God says... Sounds way too good to be true, but it's, that means it's the truth. But there's people in the church who say, oh no, that just sounds too good to be true. That can't be right. Why? Because they still think the way the world thinks. But having a proper understanding of spirit, soul, and body is actually the key. Remember what Jesus said? He said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. I'll give you the keys to unlock your understanding. And having a proper understanding of spirit, soul, and body is actually the key to unlocking the spirit realm. And raising our experience to what the Word of God says about who we are and what we have in Christ. It actually gives us access to the fullness of our inheritance Amen. in Him. Amen. Does I know it sound like good news? Amen. But you see, because the spirit realm can't be naturally seen or felt, the only way to accurately receive spiritual truth is through the Word of God. By simply taking God's Word and believing what it says. God said it. I believe it, that settles it. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. All debates are closed. All arguing is over. Or as Jesus put it even more simply, only believe. Just only believe. And there must be more to it than that. No, only believe. But surely, no, no, only believe. God said it, I believe it. That's it. That settles it. John 6, verse 63. Jesus said it's the Spirit, capital S, who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, small s, and they are life. That's why, that's why I always say that I would choose which church to be a part of primarily based upon the message that is preached and taught there. Is that right, Katrina? We, we, we made that decision a long time ago. The church that, that we will be a, that we will choose to be a part of, will, that, that we will make that choice primarily based upon the message that is preached and taught there. A word that engages my spirit rather than hooks my soul. See, I want to hear a word that speaks to my spirit. I want to hear a word that feeds my faith, not a word that feeds my ego. Not a word that feeds my curiosity. Definitely not a word that feeds my prejudice or even my preconceived ideas. No, I want a word that feeds my spirit. I want to hear a words, because you said my words, the words that I speak, they're spirit and life. That means his word can only be received in your spirit. Yeah. Only your spirit is equipped to receive that word. You see... The reason for that decision is that only God's word reveals spiritual reality. 
If you want to know what your spirit is like, if you want to know what your spirit is equipped with, then you have to find out from the Word. You can't feel it, you have to find it out from the Word. You can't just go by your emotion or by any other means. Because only God's Word is spirit and life. When you look into the Word of God, you see who you are in the spirit. When you look into the Word of God, you see what your spirit looks like. James chapter 1. I'm out. Is that right? Well, let's go and see what the word says about it. So, James chapter 1, verse 23 to 25. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Just like me on Monday morning. I can't do this. Oops, a daisy, slap in the back of the head. <laughs> a message was transmitted, communicated from my spirit. Well, <clears throat> lest you forget. <laughs> Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently, listen to this, into the perfect law that gives freedom. And the New King James says the perfect law of liberty. Imagine a law of liberty. The law is usually about logging you up. Yes. No setting you free. Come on. <laughs> the law is usually about placing limitations on you. Not removing the limitations. This is the perfect law. This is God's law. The perfect law of liberty. Of freedom. The perfect law that gives freedom. And continues in it. Not forgetting what they have heard but doing it. They will be blessed. Come on. Jesus became a curse for us. Why? So that the blessing could come upon us. What does that blessing contain? Everything. 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 Every manifestation of the curse. Sin, sickness, oppression, poverty. Everything. Every manifestation of the curse has been broken. For those who simply take God at his word. Look into the mirror of the perfect law of liberty. I know it's saying very religious, but it's the absolute truth of God's word. It's not very traditional, but it's the absolute truth. Of God's work. Take it or leave it. They will be blessed. In what they do. They will walk in the fullness of the blessing. They will no longer have to endure. The, any manifestation of the curse. In their lives. God's word folks. Is a spiritual mirror. Who knows, who knows if you look into a, into a mirror. A physical mirror. It's not actually yourself. That you're seeing You see, you can see me today, I trust you can, anyway, if not, we'll pray for your eyes, but... <laughs> you can see me today, but if I look in the mirror, it's not me I see. It's a reflection of who I am. The truth is that none of us have ever actually had the opportunity to look at ourselves. Only a reflection, maybe a photograph, but that, come on. And yet we trust what we see. Don't we? Well, no, sometimes people ask questions like, does it look bigger than this? But anyway. <laughs> it's not okay for us to feel that what we are wearing looks okay. We look in a mirror and then we believe what the mirror tells us. You notice when you're at the, at the barbers or the hairdressers, you're getting a haircut, there's always a mirror in front of you. And we trust what we see in the mirror, and we trust what we see in the mirror to inform us of whether or not the barber or the hairdresser is doing what we ask them to do, and what they're doing is to our satisfaction. We can't just go by how the haircut feels. That's right. we, have, we, we, but we have to trust what we see. I, I, went, I had a haircut one time in America, and it was the most disconcerting thing ever, because he turned the chair around. And my back was to the mirror, and I couldn't see what he was doing. And I had to trust that this guy knows what he's doing because I can no longer see what he's doing. And at the end of it, he turned me around and looked in the mirror and said, is that okay? You're like, and you know what I mean, if you're, a, if you're a guy and you're getting a haircut, they always bring the mirror around the back of your head so you can see what's in the, what the back looks like. They say, is that okay? Don't they? Come on. Yeah. Right, that, I don't know, he did a pretty good job. I looked like a GI or something right now. <laughs> You ever been a barber that only knows one haircut? <laughs> it doesn't matter what you ask for, you just get the same haircut. 
Halleluja. Ik weet dat ik bereid ben, ik moest bij elkaar nemen. Amen. Amen. You see, it's exactly the same with our born again spirit. God's word is a perfect reflection of who we are in the spirit. Why do you think it keeps saying, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ? This is, who your spirit, this is what your spirit looks like. I am who God says I am, whether I feel like it or not. And I want to tell you, sometimes I feel very far from it. But I cannot trust my feelings. I have to go back to what God says. I have to go back to the mirror. Come on, I'm not sure what my hair feels like today. I have no idea what my hair feels like. The more I do that, the worse it's going to look probably. But I go to the mirror and I get... Yeah. <laughs> I can do what God says I can do regardless of how I might feel about that. Here is another bit of that article by Jaylee Grady. He said, After one discouraging experience in which an audience stared coldly at me with their arms folded a bit like this morning, <laughs> <laughs> No, you're good there, you're good there, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Jaylee Grady, Jaylee Grady, Jaylee Grady, Jaylee Grady. Two people immediately unfolded their arms there. No. <laughs> After one discouraging experience, only one he's lucky, in which an audience stared coldly at me with their arms folded, I determined that preaching surely must not be my calling. I shared my struggle with an older pastor, and he said this, he said, Sometimes I feel discouraged after I speak. Does that ever happen to you? And he said, I was sure he would counsel me to stop preaching. But his answer shocked me. Son, he said, I feel that way every Monday morning. I feel that way every Sunday night, man. <laughs> you see, I have, I have what God says I have, even if I feel like I have nothing. That's why the Word of God says, let the weak say, I am strong. Who's the, he's the guy who feels weak. Now, if he continues to go by how he feels, he'll stay weak. But let the weak say, I am. That's ridiculous. That's stupid. Except it's God that's saying it. And if God's saying it, I'm going to take a hold of that because if yeah. I do what God says, son, the blessing, I'm going to walk into the blessing. Of that. Yeah. Let the poor say, yeah. I'm skint. <laughs> well, let the poor say, I am rich. <laughs> Who said that? God said that. Mm-hmm. Sounds too good to be true. It must be God that said it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hallelujah. What God's word says is the only way that I can know who I am in spirit. Because feelings are fickle. Feelings come and go. Come on. We all know about that. But God is always faithful. And his word is not fickle. It's not temporary. It's not based on our feelings. His word is eternal and it's unchangeable. When everything else passes away, his word will remain. And those who are holding on to his word... Well, they'll remain too. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not, I mean, this doesn't even sound right to Pentecostals and Charismatics, but it is not necessary to feel God's power inside the world. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I'll say that again. <laughs> I said it's not. I want to release some people. I'm not here to bind you up. I'm here to set you free. Because a lot of people don't do a lot of things because they don't feel like they can do it. If you're born again, and you have the Holy Spirit residing within you, then I'll tell you, you can do an awful lot more than you feel you can do. Mm-hmm. You can do anything that he asks you to do. It isn't necessary to feel God's power inside of us. It's only necessary to trust the word of God that promises that his power. By the way, that's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Yeah. That that power is inside of us. I mean, maybe you've tried, I've probably tried it. Have you ever tried to feel anointed? <laughs> you know, you try to work it up, don't you? Come on. I want to feel anointed. You know? Have you ever thought that you had to wait until you feel anointed? Mm. It'll be a long wait sometimes. <laughs> that which is spirit, big S, is spirit, small S. And that which is flesh, is flesh. It is completely and utterly futile 
trying to feel what cannot be felt. Instead of just looking into the mirror of God's word and simply trusting the spiritual reality that we see there. Amen? Amen. If you and I are a born again believer, we have experienced a complete inner transformation, whether we feel like it or not. Who said that? God said that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 18. Therefore, if anyone, say anyone, anyone. who knows that includes you and me. Yeah. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has. <laughs> I'm really glad about that. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. What's that ministry? Go out and tell everyone else they've been reconciled too. All they have to do is pick it up. Hallelujah. All they have to do is believe that. Something supernatural can happen for someone who believes that. Hallelujah. That person's just entered into a supernatural realm and they should never come back from that place. Never allow anyone to argue them out of that place. Never allow their unrenewed intellect to get in the way of that and block that. The international version very simply and succinctly says the old has gone and the new has come. What does that tell me? It's a done deal. It's a done deal. But let me just encourage you this morning. Unless we understand the reality of, soul, of spirit, soul and body, we will struggle with that truth. Because if we look at our body or we consider how we feel physically or emotionally, we probably don't feel very often like the old is gone. In fact, some of us, we might even start out buzzing. You know what happens when you start out buzzing? People tell you, I don't worry, you'll soon be like the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You start out buzzing on fire, but the first time you feel a bit down, the first time you feel a wee bit down, we might think we've lost what we had. Or even, even worse than that, we can think we've been deceived and never had anything in the first place. See, when we're born again, it's our spirit that's saved. Not our body and not our soul. It's in our spirit that the complete transformation has taken place. Please listen, our spirit has been renewed, our soul is being renewed, and our body will be renewed. But our soul and our body health right now are dependent upon the life that flows from our renewed spirit. 3 John, verses 2 and 3, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. Did God say that? I thought it was only the prosperity preachers that said that. They're the ones that picked it up. <laughs> but I thought prosperity preachers were bad people well not according to God's word in fact Jesus said the first thing he was anointed to do was preach good news to the poor what does that make Jesus? you know what? it makes him a prosperity preacher yeah. mm -hmm. That's right. a true prosperity yeah. preacher yeah. the original prosperity preacher <laughs> beloved I pray that you may prosper in all things in all things? well that's what it says and be in health. Really? Yes, really. Just as your soul prospers. How can your soul prosper? Only from that which flows to your soul from your spirit. We'll get that in a minute. For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. People came and told them the testimony of folks who were taking hold of what God said. And you know what? They were beginning to walk in prosperity in all things. See, even although we are, we are, we are physically healed by, this, by the stripes that Jesus took on his body, who knows there's still a glorified body waiting for us? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 53, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Jesus purchased our body, but he's not yet redeemed it fully. But who knows that everything that God purchases, he takes good care of and makes provision for. Yes. Yes. Come on. Yes. Gina said something this morning. She said, you know, it used to be around this island that when you saw 
a garden or outside a house that, that was that was the you know there was very few people like that like Janet you know <laughs> or like Ali now but now it's becoming the norm people every it's, it's the houses that don't have a nice garden like ours <laughs> that are in the minority <laughs> but everything that God purchases he takes good care of and he makes provision for us so he has given us authority in the spirit to resist sickness in his name he said, you're, you're going, there's a new body waiting for you. This, incorruptible, this corruptible must put on incorruption. This moral must put on immortality. But in the meantime, I've given you authority to say no to sickness. Even this, bo this body that you have is still susceptible to these things. But I give you authority to apply that which I... Come on, someone. Otherwise, that whipping that Jesus took, that incredibly awful whipping that he took was so awful that we can't even begin to understand what it was like otherwise what he took on our behalf is meaningless yeah. I don't want to ever say that mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee don't you love it when you buy something that has a guarantee? <laughs> Who has a guarantee of our inheritance? And it's not a five year guarantee either. <laughs> it's not a 12 month guarantee, and it's definitely not a five minute guarantee. It's an eternal guarantee. Who has a guarantee of our inheritance until. Who has the Holy Spirit is? Who has a guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory? As I said, when we got saved, it was our spirit that got saved. It wasn't our body. It wasn't our soul. And it wasn't our body. You know, people talk about souls getting saved, don't they? How many souls got saved? We had a big crusade. How many souls got saved? Well, we're praying for souls to get saved. Well, I'm praying for souls to get saved too. But they're the souls of those who have already been born again. Before I came here this morning, I, and before I came up here, I up in the room up the back and I got down on my knees and I asked the Lord to save souls in here today. How about you? I think most of us are already saved. Eh? Your spirit's saved. But I'm praying for your soul to get saved. Because when your soul gets saved, your body will start coming into some of that as well. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Even though people talk about souls getting saved, that's not really accurate in the context of being born again. Because even though the Word of God speaks in several places of souls being saved, we'll look at a couple. None of these instances are actually in the context of the experience of being born again. For example, Hebrews 10, verse 39. But we are not of those who draw back to destruction, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. We're already born again, and we're not going back, but we're believing to the saving of our soul. Why? Because our spirit's already saved. James chapter 1. Verse 21, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness, with humility, with teachability. No, 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 just receive with meekness. Maybe you're already arguing against this word this morning. Well, I want to encourage you, receive with meekness. The implant, I'm just a sore here, scattering seed. What condition is your heart in this morning? Are you open to receive this seed? Because if you embrace this seed and bring it down deep into your spirit, it will change your life. I'll guarantee you that. But my guarantee ain't worth much, but the Holy Spirit guarantee certainly is. Yeah. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Who's he writing to? He's writing to the church. And receive with meekness, teachability, teachableness, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Hey guys, you're already born again. Your spirit's already saved. But your soul is in the process of salvation. Being renewed. See, our soul, what is this year? We've declared this year. We believe we've received it from the Lord, a prophetic declaration. This is the year of worship in spirit, little s, and truth. Only your spirit is designed to embrace that word and to receive that word and to understand that word. To process that word. And our soul is transformed to the extent that we submit in worship to the word of God which results in the renewing of our mind 
which results in a radical change in our attitudes, which conforms our values and our lifestyles to the word of God, and then we become the living proof of the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, according to Romans 7 12. When? When our mind is renewed. Where from? From our spirit. We receive the word in our spirit, and it comes from our spirit to our soul, and it renews our mind. And come on, someone. Changes the way we think. Changes the way we act. Changes our attitudes. But that doesn't happen automatically. It's an ongoing process. Amen. As the old that has already passed away in our spirit begins to pass away in our soul and our body. And everything that became has already become new in our spirit becomes new in our soul and in our body. Amen. Our spirit is already perfected, but our soul is being perfected and our body will be perfected. Amen. When, when we finally go to be with Jesus, the and if he comes before we go, then in that instant we will be changed. Yes. In the twinkling of an eye, it says we will be changed. The transformation will become, will be completed. The transformation of, the transformation of our soul will be completed. And we will receive our glorified soul and our glorified body to complete our glorified spirit. Full set. I think we're not getting as far as I thought we'd get this morning, but I'll do it. We'll just do a wee bit more and then we're done. First Corinthians chapter 13, verses 9 to 12. For we know in part... And we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, our glorified body and soul, amen, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, please listen, hear this in the context of what we've been talking about this morning. For when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. So the partial knowledge that we have right now will become full revelation in his presence. The total transformation that has already taken place in our born-again spirit will be completed in our whole spirit and soul and body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you, set you apart, make you holy completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's helping anyone today. Mm -hmm. I, think I'll, I think I'll stop there. Have you heard enough to, to grasp some of this? To catch some of this? Yeah. Hallelujah. Receive with meekness the implanted word that is able to save your souls. I'm gonna, I'd like to carry on. But <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Father, in Jesus' name, I just pray over your precious people today, Father. I pray that none of us, not one of us, not even just, not even one of us, Father, would miss out on anything of the fullness of the inheritance that you've made possible, that you've made available, that you've made accessible. <laughs> Father, I pray for anyone who, who thinks they have to wait until heaven to receive so much of what you've provided for us here on earth. Lord, you even, even encourage us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it has already been done in heaven. You, you, you counseled us, you encouraged us to draw heaven into the earth, that which is already established in heaven, to draw it into the earth. To draw that which has already been provided in heaven. So Father, this morning I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here today and who recognizes, Lord, even just through this short message this morning, that they're missing out on something. Maybe they've been struggling against something long-term, a sickness, or, 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 or struggle with sin, or addiction, or anything else. Father, I pray that today they would know if they're born again, and if they're not born again, they can get born again. Right now, by simply taking you at your word, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him simply only believes in him, and what he accomplished and what he did on our behalf at the cross should not perish but have everlasting life. If we're born again today, help us to understand that everything has already been accomplished 
in our spirit, everything has already been deposited. The power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Father, the authority, you've given us authority over sickness. Lord, you said it, behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy so that nothing, 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 zilch, zero, nothing, nada, shall ever be able to hurt you or harm you. Why? Because I've given you authority, I've placed it in your spirit. Use that authority. Just use that authority, whether you feel like it or not. Even after you've used it, if you don't feel any different, what's that got to do with anything? Just stand up and begin to declare it and proclaim it and begin to give thanks for it. And I'll guarantee you, the Holy Spirit guarantees you. It says that they went out in Mark 16, they went out and they preached everywhere, the Lord confirming the word with the accompanying signs. Hallelujah. We're not supposed to be running around as, as born-again believers looking for signs and wonders. We are the signs and the wonders. Hallelujah. We are supposed to be pointing people to the reality that Jesus Christ really does sit on the throne of heaven yeah. at the right hand of his Father, interceding for us, ensuring that what he did on our behalf becomes a reality in our lives. He prays the Father, the Father sends the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit does what only the Holy Spirit can do. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name. Of the Lord. I said you can do church without the Holy Spirit, but you can never be the church without the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, bless us as your people that we might be a blessing out there. As we begin a new week, Lord, as we go into this week, Lord, among our families, our friends, our work colleagues, wherever we go, Father, help us to be that light that shines in the darkness, that releases that testimony. Lord God, that points people to the cross, that points people to the place of, the, of great exchange, the place where lives are changed and transformed once and for all and forever. That you may receive all the glory and all of the praise. Yes. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen.